Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the qualifying round is over, and the only team that thought that Edmonton was an upgrade from where they live is on their way home. The Calgary Flames beat the Winnipeg Jets in five games, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to break it down for you and look ahead to uh, the quarterfinals. So, Matt, before we get into each game, overall thoughts on that round? Well, I thought Chicago played really well and definitely deserved to send Edmonton home. Oh, wait, they're already there. <laughs> they just have to leave the bubble. Yeah. Um, what about the Calgary Flames Winnipeg Jets series? Uh, that went, well, in terms of the end result, uh, I think that was pretty much what I was expecting. Um, how they traveled the di- through the four games was not exactly what I was expecting, but you know, when, you know, three of the Jets players get hurt in game one, it kind of throws a whole huge wrench into things. Well, let's start with that. And I think you and I were on um, another podcast, our friend Kevin Olenek's show, The Hockey Podcast, and this question came up there. And why don't we start with this one just as an overarching theme? How much credit do you give the the Jets injuries for the Flames' success? Not much like I I think that if Shifley and Line had been in the games that maybe the series goes to five but I think it still would have been a four game series and like I think that the Flames would have played better in game two had there not been that whole you know brouhaha about Paul Maurice and the you know all the his overreaction with Kachuk and all that I tend to agree with you. I think that, you know what, I'm not going to discount that it did probably affect the Flames for the better. I think, you know, anytime you have star players out, it's going to help you. But I feel like the way we saw the Flames play, and we'll dig into this in just a minute here when we break down the four games, in game one, three, and four, I think they still could have won those games, even with Shifley and Line there. You might not have had a 6-2 win, but I think the way we saw the Calgary Flames play this series, I think they would have got the win either way. Yeah, same here. Like, the Flames were clearly the better team throughout, and I don't think that them missing those players would have made that much of a difference. No, and I mean, if you were to look at, say, uh, Pittsburgh Penguins without Mulk and Crosby, you're definitely not going to go very far. But I think the Jets still had enough guys, and even guys stepping up, like Andrew Kopp and whatnot, who are stepping up. Um, you know, to I don't want to say to fill those roles, but to do an add a, a decent job trying to fill some of that offense for the team. So it's not as though they had no offensive power after that. Yeah, and Calgary just is a deeper, and like we in our preview even mentioned, like the Flames have four lines, where the Jets have the top six, and then not really much else beyond that, and that that was going to be one of the key factors in the series and it became even more accentuated with the injuries happening but still it was clear that the flames were going to because of the fact they had the deeper team that if they were playing and showed up they would win yeah i don't want to discount that it i don't want to say it didn't help the flames at all but i'm seeing a lot of discussion online about people Um, you know, saying the only reason the Flames won is the injuries. And I think you're really discounting what the Calgary Flames accomplished, if that's your belief. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump into these games, shall we? Yep. Game one, the Calgary Flames go into this. We have to be careful with our language here. I'm hearing people call this the playoffs. This is not the playoffs yet. And I'm hearing people call this round one. This is round zero. So we'll call this the qualifier. Um, we, We moved into the qualifier and a lot of unknowns. Who was Calgary going to start net? What Calgary Flames team were we going to see? Um, And I think this was a very surprising game. My notes for this game pretty much said the Flames had the better all-around game here and did a a good job of keeping the Jets out of the offensive zone. They really didn't let the Jets get momentum. The Flames didn't let their foot off the gas in the third as they're so often known to do. You and I have so many conversations about you know what, the Flames were playing well, and then they let the other team in, they couldn't recover. And I was just kind of waiting for that, weren't you? Oh, for sure. And they started off the game slow, and like especially even after the Shifley injury, the team started off 
and it's like you're you're seeing the game evolve and it's like okay is the engine gonna turn on but then it started to build and build and build and then the flames just took over and ran with it the rest of the way one of the things I heard uh, described on social media was that this was like a book. It had a good beginning, middle, and end. You know, there you could see that progression. And, you know, you're right. They weren't maybe where they needed to be at the beginning, but they were able to keep ramping up. And, and that's something we don't often see with this Flames team. Yeah, and it certainly was a departure from even the regular season. And, like, that's been part of what we've been harping on and why the Flames were the eighth seed in this They get up play and then they just tank late in the yeah. game. Or they get down early by a significant amount and then, oh, we're supposed to come back? <laughs> yeah, well, and that's it. They just turn off at that point. Yeah. Um, and another note I had here, Kachuk, both during this game and in the media stuff before the game, he really looked more like a leader than I think we'd ever seen him. I mean, during this game, we'll talk about the hit in a minute, but... You know, even the way he responded to that, the way he didn't seem to let Maurice get under his skin after that, and some of the things he was saying to the media before, I just thought, wow, this guy, you can really see his maturity. And you and I have talked about it before. I think Kachuk's probably the next captain of this team. I'm going to go a little bit further. He started to take steps towards becoming, for this iteration of the Flames, what Jerome Aginla was to that iteration of the Flames. In what way? being both a quality leader on the ice and off the ice. And, like, when you saw the Shifley hit, it wasn't an intentional hit. Like, it's not like Kachuk went with a flying kick to hit the guy or anything like that. It was just a... Well, he, apparently Paul Maurice has different footage, but... Yeah, well, it whatever is in Paul Maurice's mind, nobody else saw. So. We still haven't seen this blue line camera that definitively shows he went to injure the guy. Yeah, to me and like every other camera feed I've seen, it, it seemed like he was just finishing a check like he, what you see a hundred times in a game, but you know, it just had a disastrous result, unfortunately, for Shifley. But immediately after that, Blake Wheeler came over and talked with Kajuk and was angry at him, which is understandable because Shifley is an important player, and... The next time they're out there, Kachuk uh, instantly comes off the bench, drops the gloves, and, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and just that level of respect of, okay, this bad thing happened, let's go, answer the bell right away, no questions asked, even though Wheeler had, like, four inches on him and all that. Well, and that was the thing about Jerome, is he knew what to do at the right time for his team. Right? There's yeah. times to fight, times not to fight. Times that he needed to go get that big goal. And I think we're starting to see that with Kachuk as well. He knows kind of what he needs to do to energize his team when. He's not just going out there to goon it up just because. Yeah, and it it's one of those where like he's taking that next step in his evolution to becoming a true superstar player in this league. And it, it's nice to see. Yeah, I agree. Let's talk about the goaltending here. Going into this, we had no idea who the starting goalie would be. As we know, the Calgary Flames started Cam Talbot and rode Cam Talbot for all four games. Cam Talbot, to me, looked like the guy with playoff experience. Like He looked like a goalie who was ready for the playoffs and didn't get shaken at all. We know that David Riddick has had some struggles late in his seasons. He's had some knee injuries, elbow injuries, that sort of thing. Um, is that the decision you would have made if you were the coach? Well, to me, I, when I was looking at the game against Edmonton heading into this qualifying thing, it, it, it because of the overall talent level between Talbot and Riddick, they're basically comparable. It's going with who has the hot hand right now. And it, Riddick played rather poorly in that Oilers game, and Riddick, or Talbot played decently for his half. And it, you go with, because it's such a short series, you go with the guy who's looking better at the moment, and Talbot was the guy. And then he took the ball and ran with it. 
And I wouldn't have been surprised if, you know, we lost game one to see David Riddick in for the first part of that back-to-back game two. Yeah. Um, I think the coaches were ready to make that move, but I think Talbot showed, and it's weird because you and I talked going into the series about how the better goaltender is Hellebuck, but really the best goaltending performance came from Cam Talbot. Yeah, and Talbot, when he's on his game, can be one of the top goalies in the NHL. It's just when he's on his game and for this series he full marks and I have to actually give more credit to the Flames overall team defense because of the fact that they clogged up the middle of the ice that whole home plate area usually had a few Flames players including a forward or two helping out to make sure that nobody from the Winnipeg got good scoring opportunities in that area and so most of Winnipeg's shots throughout the series were from the point or the half wall and those are relatively easy saves for any goaltender well that's kind of what I meant earlier when I was saying if the Flames played the way they did I think even with uh, Shifley and Line A in the lineup because they they were limiting good shots, and even good players who don't get good shots aren't going to score that often. And you're right, Flames did a great job of flushing these guys to the sides and either making them shoot at bad angles or just making them put a puck on net for the sake of putting a puck on net a lot of times. Yeah, and when you look at the Jets' goals, like they had to beat the Flames' defense. Like It mm-hmm. wasn't like there was, oh, this guy scored. And, like, you know, everybody's off to the side and the guy's wide open. There wasn't anything like that. The players had to earn the opportunity to score on the Flames. And, you know, it thankfully that didn't happen too often in the series, but it was good to see uh, that they contained them to only six goals in the four games. And I think, and this is something we'll probably talk about throughout these four games, but especially in this first game, um, special teams, so important in this game. The Flames had three specialty game, special teams goals. They had the Goudreau power play goal, the Tobias Reeder shorthanded goal, and the Michael Backlund power play goal. And that's one of the things you and I have talked about during the regular season is, you know what, these guys are giving up a lot of good chances when they have the man advantage. And so it's really good to see that they're, I would say this whole series, not only capitalizing on the power plays, but keeping a lot of penalty kill goals out too. And I would say these first two games, I mean, the Flames took a lot of penalties. There was a lot of chances for the Jets to score those power play goals, but they did well on, I'd say, on both sides of special teams. Yeah, and that's where having uh, the penalty killers with uh, Derek Ryan, uh, Michael Backlund, and uh, Mark Jankowski helps significantly because those guys are all up the middle are all excellent at killing penalties and it makes the job for the other team harder when you have competent defenders especially with all four of the forwards through the penalty kill uh, it's hard for the other team to get goals when they're facing good players like the flames were able to I think, feast on some rather poor depth players for the Jets. And I think that's part of the reason why the Flames were able to score so many power play goals through the series. Poor depth players, and and as you and I talked about before this series, poor defense. I mean, if you look at this Jets defense, there's really nobody on it. You've got Josh Morrissey, who I think we could all say is an NHL defenseman, Dylan DeMello, Dmitry Kulikov, Neil Pionk, Nathan Bolio, um, and Tucker Pullman. Yeah. It's basically, like, Morrissey's the only guy that would be a top four defenseman on the Flames, and then everybody else... On most teams. Yeah. But uh, everybody else would be in that third pairing or not in the lineup for I'll be honest, when we were covering the Winnipeg series uh, last show before this started, I looked at this and I went, huh, I didn't even know Kulikov was still in the NHL. Same here, (laughs) to be perfectly honest. I assumed he'd gone back to Russia or something. Like, you know, this just seems like a collection of bodies on defense and the flames capitalized on that which well, to well, their credit it, they needed to which it makes sense like you look at where the jets were like they ha- were one of the best teams in the nhl last season and then they lost almost their entire defense core 
And, you know, like, if you, say, kept Giordano and lost everybody else and replaced them with spare parts, the team's going to take a major hit. Like, I don't care which team you are, you're going to see a huge downturn. And For sure, and I don't disagree, but even if you look at the defensemen we picked up at the deadline and defensemen that were available at the deadline, there was chances to upgrade for cheap that they didn't take. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like, mean, they, they could have given the same price as we gave for Gustafsson and Forbort, and they would have had a, a second pair of guys that are serviceable instead of Kulikov and Pionk. Yeah. And frankly, I like uh, as bad as it sounds, I think Forbort would have been on their first pairing. Could be, yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of good defensemen available in the summer. We won't delve into this now but including one of our defensemen probably Hamannick or Brody we can't afford both so there's definitely some chances for them to upgrade come whenever offseason is this year November yeah sure I'll probably why say not July just because of habit yeah <laughs> that time in the future when you know <laughs> in a world where hockey's not being played we need the Morgan Freeman voice yeah <laughs> Um, winter has else? come. Winter has come, but there is no hockey to be found. <laughs> winter is here. We're not playing hockey. We're signing overpriced free agents. <laughs> so, instead yeah. of July first, maybe we'll be sitting on November eleventh, Remembrance Day, and watching what do they call it? Free agent frenzy. Yeah. Um, it's almost a holiday, anyways. So, but anyway, getting back to where we were. Um, anything else about Game One you wanted to chat about? Uh, it was, it set up an interesting thought of what game two would be, because to me, like, it felt a lot like game one in the Colorado series, and I point. was gonna, I was looking to see, because, like, in that game one against Colorado, the Flames started off a little slow, and then they built up, and they ended up winning that game 4 nothing, and then game two happened, and with game two here it was a very similar story for sure and i think you're right we you and i have also talked about the consistency of this team and we got one good game out of them and i wonder the same okay are we gonna get the same thing in game two or is this team going to as you mentioned in the colorado series come out flat in game two and almost underestimate their opponents and well game two the flames did not win they won four to one in the first game and they lost three to two in the second game um this game, Shifley and Line A were out for the whole game. Those two guys accounted for 26% of Winnipeg's goals this year. So, obviously, Winnipeg, you would think, sort of being depleted, um, the the Jets probably would not have won this game, but they did. And I think this came down to the Flames underestimating their opponents. Some notes that I had here. In the first, I thought too many times the Flames only had one guy on offensive zone rushes. Like, we were seeing in that first game two, three guys rush on the net. And in this one, we'd have one guy, and you're not going to score like that. No, and there was no intensity from the Flames. It was like, oh, well, the Jets suck, so we'll eventually score. And, like, there was no actual work put into actually, you know, trying or doing any of the things that you need to actually do to win a postseason game. And they seem like they did what they did so often in the season was they get down, they start just playing hockey and not playing by any system, and then everything starts to fall apart. And even in the second, we saw the Flames were down by two, and they couldn't get the puck out of their end. Like, they just kept sh throwing it from flame to flame in their end, and the Jets were getting a lot of really good shots at that point because the Flames couldn't get out of their end. And it just seemed like the Flames ran out of gas, as you and I have talked about, so early in this game. Yeah, and it was just such a frustrating... Like, especially after they tied it, it, it's like they couldn't keep the foot on the gas, and they just allowed the game to slip away. And it, this basically... If the Winnipeg Jets were a better team, I think that they would have scored seven or eight goals against the Flames in this game. Like, if they had a full top six and were you know, playing well. Like, the fact that they were so depleted it was the reason why they only scored three. And, like, Calgary, it re literally reminded me exactly of Game 2 against Colorado last year, where it was just 
so like even though the flames outshot them 30 to 26 which was uh, you know starkly different last year it just seemed like they couldn't get anything to go right at all and it, they just it i'm going uh, like after this game it was like if they don't respond we have to make major changes to this team because like you can't just go through a whole season and then oh well it's time to actually show up and you put up that kind of an effort one thing i noticed in this one it's something i mention you so often this season and last season and really as long as i can remember when the flames get down they start playing a disciplined hockey and they take more penalties when the flames lead in penalty minutes they generally lose and this one they had 14 penalty minutes tied with the jets but i would say a good portion of the reason the flames lost here is they were playing far too much hockey shorthanded even though the jets only got one power play goal i thought they got a lot of good chances on the power play you know like the flames were just we were and when you start getting that many penalty minutes your lines get messed up you're getting guys they're double shifting they're getting tired it messes a lot of things up so i really think as I've mentioned, when the Flames take too many penalty minutes, they lose the game, and, and that's what happened here. Yeah, it, it's like it, it all just builds and crescendos through the game, and like one mistake leads into like three more, which leads into three more, and it just snowballs. And, and when they're getting frustrated, they're letting their frustrations come out and get the better of them. Yeah, like they have to keep it simple, stupid, as they say. Yep. Um, well, after game two, I was kind of worried about what we'd see the next night for the back-to-back -back with Winnipeg. I kind of worried, as we've seen so often with this team, they get down in a game like that, and it just builds on itself and builds on itself. And I honestly thought we would probably see them going into game three. I thought we'd probably see them lose both, just based on what we saw with game two. Um, but very different result. Calgary won this one six to two. And I said in my notes here, the Flames played a much more disciplined first period than they did the night before, and they really got rewarded for that. Yeah, and like this was the game that I was really looking forward to after seeing how flat they were. How are you going to respond? And yeah. it, it, are you going to actually show up? And... I thought that they had a very good effort throughout this game, and they kept everything. I frankly, I don't think that when it, other than Winnipeg's two goals, I don't really think that they had any other scoring chances throughout the entire game, and I think that the Flames just kept putting it to them throughout the contest, all the way until it was six to two, and. Yeah, I think like, just like you mentioned in the first game, I think the Flames did a really good job of limiting where the shots came from in this game. And even though the Jets technically put 35 pucks on net, there weren't a lot of really quality scoring shots for, or scoring chances for them. Yeah, and like the, by the way, like this is one of the reasons why I'm always a little skeptical when people lead with Corsi arguments because just because the Jets outshot the Flames that, oh, well, they should have won that game. No, Um Teams that are doing poorly tend to throw everything at the net, trying to hope to get some bounce to go their way. And yeah, uh, that was basically what uh, was the case in this one. And frankly, like I don't think that, despite facing 35 shots, I don't think Talbot was really tested much throughout the contest. Natural stat trick has a heat map for every game. And I find if I really want to get a better sense of what the shots were, I look at that because it shows where the shots were coming from. And, and I think that's a better sort of not definitive, but a better look than Corsi at just the number of pucks on net of where did those pucks come from? And so I tend to use that if I'm looking at, yeah, where were these 35 shots, you know, on the ice um, flames only had four penalty minutes this one to the jets eight. So only had to kill two penalties. Um, and the Flames actually ended up capitalizing on those eight minutes of Jets uh, penalty time. The Flames scored two power play goals. Obviously, the Lindholm goal and the Monaghan goal were both on the power play. Oh, and the Lucic goal as well. So just like we talked about in the first game, the Flames really came out and capitalized on the special teams play. And uh, speaking of Lucic, uh, I don't know about you, but I thought he was the Flames' best overall player throughout the four games. 
Yeah, I would say so. I think I think also a guy who very much like Sam Bennett, who really stepped up in the playoffs. And we we're expecting that from him. He's a veteran. He's won a cup. He knows what's going on there. And I agree with you. He was sort of like we talked about with Kachuk going into this. Um, I think he knew what the team needed and when they needed it. I mean, we saw his uh, his fight in, ga- in the last game there. You know, he sort of, he knew, and you could see from his emotion. I mean, there was the time he was in the penalty box and we scored and he's standing up pumping his fists. Like, yeah, he was just, he was into it. And I, I agree with you. He was a really good part of the Flames lineup. Can we now say we won that trade with Edmonton? And we get a bonus third round pick. So, you know, uh, the next Adam Fox, come on down. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, people criticize that, but we got value for Adam Fox. Oh yeah, I'm not arguing, but you know. Uh, with the Flames drafting of late, like outside of the goaltenders, they've been hitting a lot of their yeah. second and third round picks. And so, the Flames haven't know. had a lot of high picks lately. No, but uh, thankfully when they've had them, they've been hitting the mark with either good prospects like Dylan Dubé and NHLers like Dylan Dubé or very good tradable assets like Adam Fox. So we'll see. And Whether they use the pick or move the pick, we'll see what they do with it. Yeah, because you can always trade up or whatnot. Like, there's all sorts of different options. Throw it into another deal. Yeah, so it helps. And hopefully the Flames can utilize that in some way that benefits them. In this game, uh, this second game of the back-to-back, Game 3, I really thought in this one more than the other two, the players that needed to look good looked good. I mean, I thought Johnny looked good. We saw, you know, he got a goal. Monty got a goal. Lindholm got a goal. Like, you know, Kachuk got a goal. The guys that needed to look like the offensive power for the Flames did in this game, I thought. Yeah. And, like, I've heard some criticism of Gaudreau's line throughout. And the thing is, is that they're useful. Like, even if they're not producing what they need to, With how the second and third line are playing and are bringing their game, those guys then get to face lesser defensemen. And, like, Gaudreau and Monaghan always have to face the top pairing of the opposition. And it gives more time and space for the depth guys, and that's why the depth guys are so important. Because then if say like the the other team wants to throw out Morrissey against Kachuk's line well then uh, Gaudreau's line gets to face some rather poor guys instead and it leads to more opportunities and it's good both for the depth guys and for the Monaghan line that with everybody kind of going a little bit that it just puts even more pressure on the opposition's defense yeah, I'd agree with that. Should we move on to game four? Yep. Game four, the elimination game. Uh, best of three series. The Flames were up by two at this point, and they ended up winning the last game 4 nothing. Two goals they scored in the first, and then two empty netters at the end of the game. Um, this is the first time that the Calgary Flames scored first in this series. Winnipeg had scored the first goal in every other game. Um and I thought in this one, the Flames really made sure that Talbot could see the pucks he had to stop in the first period, like we've talked about the whole time, and I think more evident in this one. They really they really kept the Jets. Like, it's not – This is, I guess the reason I keep mentioning this, this is not the way we saw the Flames play in the regular season. And if they would have played this way, they'd be a heck of a lot higher. They'd probably even be in the round robin right now. But it was they, nice to if see they this they played like in. If they played like this all season, they're first in the West. Yeah, I agree. Like, like you know, and it's not even like they just took their game and upped it. This is a different Calgary Flames strategy. Yeah, a and, different game plan. Well, the thing is, is that with the four months off, it seems that they've had a lot of time to focus on video, because this looks a lot more like what def- uh, the type of defense that both Chicago and uh, Boston used to throw out there when they were either going to the finals or in the cup and that you know like each interaction on the defensive side the other guy you know you're basically saying to the other guy if you beat me that's great you have to go beat the other guy in order to 
make a play and like you have to beat us in several different ways in order to get a good scoring chance instead of here walk on in and yeah. you know and every time you confront the other team you're causing more of a chance of a turnover and if you're continually hounding them and not giving them any space to get any quality scoring chances the puck's gonna get turned over and you can go and attack and yeah, I if mean, the, this. I think this series, these three games the Flames won, this is the hardest I think we've seen them make their opponents work to get shots in the net in a long time. Uh, honestly, I can't... I can't even remember seeing this from a Calgary Flames team since I was a kid, frankly. Like, even in the 0304 Cup run, like, the Flames, they were good at shutting things down, but, like, not even in not playing as structured even as what we're seeing out of these guys right now. No, you're right. Um, so I, I mean, I thought in this game more than I, I didn't write down a lot about the way the team played because I think it was very similar to games one and three, but the notes I did make here, I thought that the, uh, Anderson Hannafin pair had a really good night. I think Anderson had a good, uh, series overall. And he was also the first and only flames D man to score in this round. Um, and I also thought the Dubé Bennett pairing worked well. They put those guys with other guys throughout the, uh, throughout the night, but I thought those two were playing off each other really well. Yeah, and I think that at moving forward, having the that being the third line of Lucic, Bennett, and Dubé might be a good one for the foreseeable future. And, you know, like even into next season and beyond, just because of the fact that they seem to complement each other very well. Yeah, I, th I think they, I think at one point they tried those guys in the wings with Monaghan between them. Um, but yeah. yeah, they were with Lucic for most of the night. Yeah, and I like the idea of having Sam Bennett up the middle, and he seems to play better there for whatever reason, and I think that keeping him as a center makes a lot of things easier for this team moving forward. Yeah, I think he's like Lindholm. I think he's probably a guy that eventually will find his way full-time as a center iceman, but a guy that you can put on the wing when you need to and be comfortable with the way he'll play there. Yeah. Um, but I thought good night for Dubé, good night for Bennett, a good night for the entire team, obviously. Shut out in the in the uh, qualifier, which we don't see very often. 11 Flames scored in this series, and Anderson being the only defenseman to score. So I think when I hear that number, I think this is exactly what we needed last year in Colorado and didn't get, which was everybody firing all cylinders. We kind of saw our first line disappear in that Colorado series, and the depth guys trying to pick up the slack. And here we're getting... The first line, the depth guys, like we're getting scoring throughout the, the Flames lineup. That means 10 different forwards scored a goal. Yeah, and like especially with how hard, like when that happened last year, I was taking the one silver lining of how we lost that was that they slammed themselves so hard on their face that it showed that like you really need to change how you approach things because that was as unprepared for a postseason appearance that I think I've ever seen anybody, frankly, play. Like it, it, it let alone a number one seed. Like even when the Flames uh, played Detroit that one year in oh six oh seven, where like the Flames were getting uh, like. Kipper was having to make 50 plus saves each game at least like then the flames were the eighth seed and weren't expected to actually do anything that year and you know and with how badly they played it's a major wake-up call and the flames needed to figure and especially after game two how do we respond to this and to me, in Game 3 and 4, they met the expectations of how they should have responded, and it'll be interesting moving forward, because if they hadn't played as they did in Game 3 or 4, then it's like, okay, well then maybe there is something fundamentally wrong with the makeup of this team. And 
that they just can't get it going. And so I agree with you. You you heard me even say this season, maybe it's time to move on from Goudreau, maybe it's time to move on from Monahan. But if they can keep performing the way they did in this qualifier, I think we can keep this core together. Yeah. Uh, and the question well, is if it can continue. Well, like that's why like I've always been like especially seeing the talent level in this core group. Like, uh, that's why my predictions with this team have always been overly optimistic because, like, I always look at the ta- raw talent and go, okay, well, you guys should be kicking because you guys have the talent to kick out. And yet, the yeah, follow through with the actual motivation on how to play the game properly and learning how to actually utilize those talents effectively has not up to this point reached the expectations that the talent level should be garnering and if like frankly like with the four teams that were in the play-in round like that were above everybody else and didn't have to worry about getting eliminated uh, frankly i think the the flames are better than three of them in terms of just raw talent with only the avalanche being better and yet the wherewithal and how they deploy that talent has been the question mark. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's the thing. You've looked at this team a lot as what they bring on paper, and I think we can all agree that for three, probably four of the last, let's call it the last four years, this team has underperformed what they should be. Yeah, and you know like sometimes like that series against Anaheim it wasn't the Flames fault that the goaltender turned into a complete <laughs> No, but they also didn't that, have but, playoff goaltending that year. Yeah. And like they did underperform frankly basically ever since the 14-15 season and it'll be interesting to see how this team like now that they've qualified for the playoffs how they'll actually respond against the dallas stars well let's move on to that the calgary flames have qualified for the stanley cup playoffs they're one of the final 16 teams is the first time since 08 and 09 that the team has made the playoffs two years in a row and you and i kind of joked about that coming into the season well this is a this is a non-playoff year because last year is a playoff year we'll talk to you again in 2021 so again good to see them break that break that uh the best stat that I heard was that this was the first series win for any team in Edmonton since 2006. So, And it's the first team, I actually heard as well, that's the first time a team has won a postseason game in this building. Yep, and series. So, yeah, um, it's all good. And uh, with everything shaking down the way it has, the Calgary Flames take on the Dallas Stars, as Matt said. Yeah, the, an interesting matchup that hasn't been since the early 80s when they were the Minnesota North Stars that these two teams have faced off against one another. I remember a couple times in the 90s, the Oilers and the Stars sort of had a heated thing where they were every year almost playing each other. But yeah, you're right. There's really, I would say these two teams have played good games against each other in the last two, three years that I can remember. They always seem to be competitive, fun games, but yeah, there's really been really no implication in those games at all. So it'll be interesting to see what the vibe is like on the ice for these guys yeah oh i expect with the makeup of each of these teams that it'll be an interesting series in a lot of ways they actually remind me of uh the san jose sharks actually how so uh a lot of veteran guys and more of a veteran laden team uh with a decent goaltender and not uh a huge amount of youth other than the the two good young defensemen that they have. Well, let's take a look at the Dallas Stars. I imagine a lot of our fans uh, don't know a lot about this team, but if we take a look at sort of their line combinations, uh, on the forward side, line one, Jamie Benn, Rup Hines, and Alexander Radulov on your top line. Uh, second line is Matthias Janmark, Joe Pavelski, and I don't even know how to say this guy's name, Dennis Garyanov. Garyanov. Uh, third line is Joel 
Kevran Kevranta, Jason Dixon, and Corey Perry. There's another guy like we were talking about earlier with Kulikov. I'm like, oh, Perry's still around, huh? Um, yeah. And then Cogliano, uh, Faxa, and Blake Como. Another guy I'm surprised still around. Cogliano for me was the guy that I'm like, oh, I didn't even know he played for the Stars. So yeah, huh? Yeah. So you're right. A lot of I, I want to be careful how I say this. A lot of probably over-the-hill NHLers. I mean, Cogliano, Como, Perry, guys that are probably past their prime. But you're right, a very veteran-laden team. Yeah. And, like, they're still quality guys, and you have to respect them for their abilities. It's just that... And like, often it, those it, veteran teams do have better playoff success, especially guys like Corey Perry, who we know has been to the finals or deep a lot of times. We're seeing that with Lucic on this team. We already talked about that. So they may have a bit of an edge that way too. Yeah. And, you know, like you always worry about like teams like Colorado who are just happy to be there like they were last season um, because that youthful enthusiasm got them going. Um, really, the Stars forward group is not – the fastest group um they have a good couple of defensive forwards in matthias yanmark and radic faxa uh but it basically they're just it, it's they do really remind me a lot of the san jose sharks where they have a lot of talented guys is it just because pavelski's there not no not really uh it is partially because of that but like you look at guys like sagan and ben like a lot of the Sharks guys, it's the same general-ish to me. Like, it, it, it's just very similar in feel. And yeah, uh, I can see that. And, and like, they just... It, they're kind of like an underwhelming group as a group. Like, they're good, but they're not... Well, and we were talking earlier about, you know, the Calgary Flames team looking better on paper. To me, on paper, this looks like so many NHL teams where you've got maybe four top players and a bunch of spare parts. Yeah, and, like, frankly, with Ben Sagan, Radulov, and Pavelski, and then a whole bunch of miscellaneous. And, like, where the Flames, like, they can run three good lines... Uh, to me, looking at the stars, it's two good lines and then a bunch of energy players. Here's a here's a fun little prediction game. Who do you think they're paying more to, Corey Perry or Andrew Cogliano? Probably Cogliano. Cogliano's making three and a quarter. Yeah. To play on it, the fourth line. Yeah. I know somebody who's going to be exposed to Seattle. Yep. Come um, on down. Get your fresh Cogliano. Como- Como almost two and a half. Like those are yeah. expensive spare parts. Yeah. Maybe this like, is James Neal's next stop. Who knows? Yeah. Like honestly. Yeah. Like frankly, I I would take Tyler uh, or uh, Tobias Reader over either Cogliano or Como at this point. So yeah, and he's making league minimums. So. Not exactly the best of contracts there. When I look at this forward group for Dallas, I see either overly ripe, or I guess not overly ripe, almost over the hill or not ready yet. Like, I think Rupe Hines could be a guy that could develop into something. I'm not sure he's your number one center right now. No. And you know, it, I think, like you said, Jan Mark reminds me a lot of an early, um, an early Michael Backlund where he's not quite yeah. sure what he is yet. Yeah. Yeah. So and that, I, that's a very good comparison, actually. That's, you know, like Jan, early on, I think Backlund wanted to be a scorer, a sniper type guy, and he wasn't. And the team kept pushing him more into that two-way forward defensive role, and he didn't really want to go into that. And now he's sort of embraced it, and I see some of that with Jan Mark when I see him play. Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm getting here. Like, it's, you know, it's got some names on it, and it's there's some guys here, but... Um, uh, like, how would you say, as a group, I find that the Flames have the better forwards 1 through 12. But that said, you can't disrespect the abilities of the Dallas forwards. No, that for they sure. Ha- they can be, you know, like, Jamie Benn or Tyler Sagan can throw a four-goal game on you if you give them time and space. So you have to respect them. But if you're playing adequately, I think that the Flames have the edge up front. 
Is Sagan Sagan's hurt, so I don't even know yeah, is he day he, to day? He, yeah, he should be ready for game okay. one, but so maybe if not. he if he's on that first line then Ben Sagan Radulov, that's much better. But even then Rupe Hines is your second line center unless you move him to three. I don't know. It's they've they're a lot like I think Winnipeg in that they've got a good top line and not a lot of depth under that. Yeah. And the Flames, uh, as long as they can have uh, Giordano's group out against Ben most of the time, they should be fine. Well, we're not going to get last change in the first two games, so that might be a little more of a struggle. Yeah, but still, it, it as much as is possible. And the Flames, frankly, their defense one through is good enough where like, you're not having... Uh, too many uh, times where like Gustafson's going to get exposed. Let's move on to the defensive pairings for the Dallas Stars. Much better defensive pairing than what we just faced. Um, first pairing, Essa Lindell and John Klingberg. Second pairing, Jamie Alexiak and Miro Hiskanen. And third, Andrew Sakara and Steven Johns. Um, I would say a much better top four than Winnipeg for sure. Oh, I think definitely. He, he's gonna um, has got a lot of potential. I'm not a huge fan of Jamie Alexiak, but he's one of these guys that you know what he's been around long enough. He's doing something right. Yeah, and same with Stephen Johns. Like they're both big physical defensemen. They're kind. Of, it it's sort of like facing four board twice over, but four boards better than both of them. I do think that looking at these defensive pairs, our forwards are going to have to take a lot more bodies to get a good shot on net than they did against Winnipeg. Yeah, and like with both Johns and Alexiak, like they're both 6'4", and I think Klingberg and Heskinen are uh, both tall as well. So like it's going to be a little bit more difficult than what they've just faced, but it's doable. Like I'd... The Jets' defense is very much good on the offensive side of it. Klingberg and Heskinen are both excellent. Uh, but for the defensive play, they're not that good. And then if we look at net for this team, um, Anton Kudobin and Jake Ottinger are the, the two goalies that we saw from them last series. Um, again, uh, Bishop, it, oh, Bishop, Bishop should be back, though. Yeah, we didn't see Bishop last series, but he will be probably returning soon. He's currently listed day to day. I don't think he played at all last series, did he? I'm not sure. Okay, I didn't well, really watch that, them. So, so Ottinger probably won't get any games. So it'll be Ben Bishop and Anton Kudobin, and I think really Bishop is the Flames have had troubles. It feels like with Bishop in the past, and I think Bishop could be the difference maker for Dallas. Well, and that that frankly is the reason why Dallas is where they are in the standings mm -hmm. and like if you discount their win against uh, st louis today the last time they won was back in february like they were on a huge losing streak heading into the break and like they were looking like they might even fall out of the playoff picture entirely i remember that yeah and it, it's one of those weird situations that the flames are in with a team that up front is not like they're not the best team for like the 18 skaters like they're just there are better teams out there and and frankly i think the flames included in that if you're talking both as a defense core and a forward group i think the flames have the edge but bishop when he's on his game he can steal a series all by himself and if he is playing in this series, then the Flames are going to be in a little bit of a tough spot. And that's not to say Hudobin's bad. He could probably do an adequate job, but it would be a lot easier for I, Flames. I feel if, like if Hudobin's in net, the Flames are facing a an average goaltender. Yeah. If Bishop's in net, they're facing a superstar goaltender. Yeah. that That's um, a good way of putting a, it. Still a playoff goalie in Hudobin, but um, not not a superstar guy that is you're going to run with to the cup. Yeah. Um, 
I really think in this game, Matt, the the difference is going to be which team can get better offense from their defensemen, as weird as that sounds. I think in order to beat both these goalies, you're going to need some good shots in the blue line. I think you're going to need defensemen that are moving that puck up, whether scoring or putting it on net for rebounds. I think the key for this, for either team, could be those blue liners. Yeah. On the offensive side. Frankly, I think that this series will come down to will the Calgary Flames show up? Well, and not and, only will they show up, I think, can they keep playing the way they were in the first round? Even if they show up the way they were in the regular season, it's not going to get the job done. No. And, like, I think that the Flames, if they're... It's one of those weird situations. If they can keep on them and just pressure them in, in a natural way, that I think that just... Due to the fact that they, I, in my opinion, they out talent the stars, that they'll be able to eventually wear them down enough where they'll win. It's just that they have to actually put the work in. And is that going to happen? And, like, that's been the thing that we've been harping on all season. Like, if the Flames, as they could, can, actually do show up, they're going to win this series. If the Flames, I think, show up for you know four games and they stay and they play the disciplined hockey we saw, yeah. But if they if they're, if they're showing up and they're playing without a man for most of those games, it's going to be tough to win against the Stars. Yeah, like if they get overconfident or cocky or like especially if they win like the first game or two and get overconfident, like things could turn on their head really quickly and. You know, that could be it very quickly for Calgary. I, I I know this is probably a bad thing to say. In some ways, I'm kind of hoping Calgary loses the first game because I think it's going to be a good way to keep them humble. Yeah, I could I see mean, that. I mean, you always like to see a sweep and stuff, but I think the way they responded after the Winnipeg loss, we saw a much better team afterwards. I think if Calgary were to lose the game on the 11th, we would see a much more focused team after that. Yeah, the thing I worry about with game one is if they win that game handily and, like, beat the tar we, out of them, yeah, that they'll that just... see the same thing in the Winnipeg series where they just, they they stop. Yeah, and it's like, oh, that's easy. <laughs> we don't need to try. The only worry I have is that I love the way the Flames played in the qualifier, but that style's taxing on the players. It's hard to do for four rounds, especially if you're not used to it. I wonder when they're going to start to get injuries or get guys that are hurt because of that. Um, But, you know, I think you can do it for at least one round here. And like I said, I think the biggest thing is going to be the defenseman and who can get more offense there. And also the team that can make the other team battle for territory better. There's two very talented defense groups here. I think the ones that can find the open shooting lane, which is going to be hard with both these teams, is going to be the ones that's going to score more. And... Like, it's one of those things that if the Flames can roll their top three lines one right after another and wear the other team down, like, we had success against the Jet or the Stars in the regular season. They won two of the three games, and the last one, five to one. And if the Flames can play their game, they are the better team in terms of talent. It's just can they show up and that's you know and especially after last season if they want to prove to themselves that that was an aberration and that they aren't broken as a team they need to take it to the jets they need or the stars and take them out behind the woodshed and you know (laughs) the other thing that you've heard me talk a lot about in the regular season and we didn't see i didn't think in the qualifier tell me if you would disagree We didn't see the Flames playing with their food, as I've said. We didn't see them just passing the puck around in the O-zone for the sake of moving the puck. They would have maybe two or three passes, and then they'd find a way to put it on or close to the net. But so often we see the Flames, one D-man to the other. That D-man back to the first one. In the second game, in the power plays in that, the defense for the Jets, they didn't have to move. No. At all. And it's like, okay, you want to burn your own penalty or power play opportunity? fine 
Yeah, but so often the Flames do that even strength, and it's like, just put the puck on the net, and then, of course, somebody comes and takes it from our defenseman while they're playing with it, and now we got to go all the way back to our end. So I think that'll be important, too, is just put the puck towards the net. It doesn't have to go on net all the time, but the more you can put it in the corner, the better chance your forwards have to dig it out and put it near the net. Yeah, and the more pressure that you can continually get on the, the Stars, because the Flames are the better team, that you know it, eventually you'll create those holes and score it's just it's all about the details and if the flames can play detailed hockey consistently uh, they could go far but it's if and it, if they've learned their lessons and reviewed the tape from game three and four and hey we did X, Y, and Z, and we absolutely took it to the Jets and won 10-2 over the two games. Well, let's do that. You know, if they can learn those lessons and keep with it, it they should be fine. And you were talking about how the Jets, or sorry, the Stars started to have a fall at the end of the season. They're not doing that much better either. They played three games in the round robin. They won one, lost two, only got two points had five goals for and ten goals against. So, I mean, they're still not looking like a great yeah, team here. And that one goal that they scored in the, the game today was a point shot with, like, 30 seconds left that just found a hole through, like, four guys. Otherwise, they wouldn't have even scored or won, and we'd be talking about the St. Louis Blues right now. I think, really, the the biggest question for game one is if the flames can keep playing the way they were playing and the stars keep playing the way they were playing, the flames are going to win. The stars, I think have to rise to the flames level or the flames have to fall to the stars. level. I know it sounds convoluted, but if the two teams kind of keep riding the trains they're on, I think the flames win this one. It's either going to have to be the flames fall or the jets rise to the occasion. Yeah. Does that make like, sense. Well, frankly, like if, things go as you said this is a five game series and we're talking about either vegas or st louis in the next round and you know it's one of those things that just like last season i don't really think that the avalanche beat the flames i think the flames beat the flames and i think that if the flames fall to the stars it won't be because anything dallas did well let's talk about that so last year the flames went out in the first there's a team that's Every second year, it seems, making the playoffs and going out in the first. If the Flames go in the first round to Dallas, I'm going to knock on wood my Ikea desk here that's not really wood. It's veneer over sawdust. Um, if the Flames go out in the first round, is there any way that you can say this team still accomplished something? They were still better than last year. And for, to me, I think just what you said, if the Flames go down fighting and they go in with a fight, I think we can say that they learned and they they made progress from last year. If they roll over and die again, I think you've got to look at blowing this team up. Yeah, and that's the key. Like, I, I honestly don't care if the Flames lose a series if you go down punching. It's, it say, like in the 4 Cup run when the Flames lost to Tampa Bay. You know, I didn't, you know, it sucked that they didn't win the Cup, but, you know, Tampa... They did win the Cup. It was in, Matt. Yeah, I know, but... You know, the doesn't say that in the scorebook, so you got to go with it. But Tampa for, you know, like they gave it their all to Tampa and they didn't quite have enough in the tank. And that was the difference. And But, you know, it's not like the Flames were outclassed and got swept like the Florida Panthers in 96. It's one of those things that, you know, if they can go mono a mono and lose, oh well, you know, great. You gave a good it your all and you'd lost. So what? Yeah, if these guys can go down fighting, I think we can almost wring at least another se season out of this core. If they just roll over and die, I think it shows, you know what, we need some guys that do want to do this and can do this to come in in the off season. Yeah, and it, that's where you start to see certain players that – uh cycling them out for even just other versions of the same guy just the, to get a different personality group in the team yeah for sure 
Well, I think that's probably as much as we want to preview the Stars. Anything else you want to say about the Stars going into this? Uh, not really. Um, it, it, there, it's a weird matchup just because the Flames don't really have any history with them. So it's in terms of the postseason. So it's not like you know, like there's any recent bad blood. It's just kind of a oh, okay, it's you guys. And, and it's weird, when you talk to different Flames fans, whether casual or hardcore, everybody has a different thought on the Stars. And everybody, you know, there's not, like you said, no bad blood, no rivalries. My mom is partial to Stars because the first Flames game she ever went to was against Dallas. And she remembers that. And, you know, the Flames ended up, I think, losing OT. So she's like, oh, they're a tough team. But yeah, there's a team that has all sorts of opinions, but there's nobody out there... Pro or con, you don't see anyone wearing a Dallas jersey around Calgary like you do Edmonton and Vancouver. Um, but you also don't see anyone who's out there, I hate the Dallas Stars. Yeah, it's like they're there. Like mm -hmm. it, It's sort of like the Minnesota Wild. It's like, eh, okay, you exist. Uh, okay. It's interesting sure. you compared those two teams because they used to be the Minnesota North Stars. Yeah. Where they just kind of existed too. That's why they left. Yeah, it's like it, it, even like Colorado last year, we didn't have a playoff series against them, but we were in the same division for so many years that there was some bad blood just because of that. And like there was history mm -hmm. there. And I feel like Colorado was also a good team for so many years. You know, when they had Sackick and Forsberg and all that, I think there's still a little bit of that rub that, oh, we beat the Avalanche. Yeah, true enough. You know, and Dallas has had some cups, but I don't look at them as, I don't look at them as a, a you know, a real, per, you know, a, a real winner in the NHL for a long time. Yeah. Like, there's not a ton of difference between, say, them and the Hurricanes. Like, yeah, they won a cup. I, I, I hate Ducks, to say so this, like, but, but they've almost been, you, they could be replaced with generic playoff team five. Yeah. Like, they're a good team, but they haven't done anything where you're going to look back and go, those Dallas Stars in the mid two thousands, even though they didn't win, they were blank. Well, you hit it right on the head. They were blank. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like there's teams uh, we look at that even though they don't win, we can say, "Wow, they were really tough." Or, "Wow, they had great offensive weapons." Or that goaltender. You know, yeah. you're not going to look back at the Dallas Stars of the mid two thousands and go, "Oh, that Dallas Stars, they were something." Yeah, that Marty Turco could pass the puck, and now goalies I can't feel do like, that honestly, anymore. <laughs> Okay, maybe that's the thing. If I look at Dallas, their sort of legacy in my mind, they've always had a good goalie. Yeah. Like that's when I when I'm just I'm just thinking casually. I'm not looking at any stats or any rosters. Every time I think of Dallas, I think Dallas has a good goalie. Like just the Dallas goalies are sticking out in my mind. Yeah. Like even extending back like even before Ed Belfort, like they had Andy Moog there briefly and Yeah. Yeah. Then Turco for all those years, and now Bishop, and yeah, it it's pretty much synonymous. Dallas and good goaltending, and like there's some. And hopefully teams... that won't be the bane of our existence this round. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see. Like the Flames already defeated one Vesna candidate, so you know they if they have it in them to do that to Hellebuck, that they need to not have the concern about the goalie being in their head like that you know they can beat anybody yeah and, and i think that the cam talbot showed you know what we have just as good a goalie as anybody else yeah well let's talk about the schedule for this round obviously this is a seven game series again unlike the best of five that we saw earlier so seven games have been scheduled. We have times for the first four. Matt, the last three are now to be determined. We were looking at the schedule earlier, and the last two are scheduled for midnight. So they've now changed those back to to be determined. But the first game against the Dallas Stars, we will be the away team, and it will be on Tuesday the 11th, uh, 3.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Then Thursday the 13th and 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time will be the second game. And a back-to-back -back there Friday we're the home team, again at 8.30 Mountain Time. So another late game. Uh, then we get Saturday off and we come back on uh, Sunday the 16th for a matinee. Not some of the Flames are doing well with, but we get that matinee game. And then if needed, the other three games will be the 18th, the 20th, and the 22nd with times to be determined. So 
really all over the board for times here. We have a 3.30 start, an 8.30 start, an 8.30 start, and a 12 start. No no quor- three-quarter after the hour starts. It was so weird last round that we had a 45 after start. Yeah. Well, um, one good thing is the for the, the first three games, it's three games and four nights, and with Bishop and Sagan being day-to-day and still questionable for even game one, that it'll be tough for those guys to get in and be ready to go for three games and four nights. Like, it'll be tough for them, even if they are ready to go. Well, and even with Bishop, if he's still sort of day-to-day, I don't know they would play him in both of the back-to-backs unless they're desperate. I think you might see Hudobin play in one of those if Bishop's not 100%. Yeah, and so hopefully the Flames can capitalize on any flaws that they might have and just take it to them. Like, they, the Flames really didn't need to be ready for 5.30 on Tuesday. Let's 3:30. go. 3.30. Oh, 5.30 Eastern, my mistake. If they're ready at 5.30, we're screwed. That's the way that they've played so many games already. Yeah. It's just give the other team the first period and we'll come out in the second and beat you. Yeah, well, be ready for the opening puck drop then. and Whenever they decide to drop it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I think the Flames and, – and I was thinking about this going into the series. We've had four days of rest. We last played Thursday, so we have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off. I think after that last series, I don't think the time off is going to affect the Flames. I think it's actually going to help them to rest up a little bit because that was probably a very grueling series the way the Flames were playing. Yeah, and the Flames just need to engage physically but not – one of the things I've noticed is that – they get a little enthusiastic with the hitting, trying to be like Furland was against Vancouver that one year, and it gets them off of their game. It, it was more evident in the Edmonton pre-qualifier game, where like for the first 10 minutes, the Flames were just running around trying to hit the Oilers, and it caused them to go down 2 nothing. Well, I think a lot of these guys just haven't hit anything since March, sure. so they were just excited to be back on the ice. Yeah. True enough. I won't make a joke about how it's been COVID. The guys can't hit this, but um, yeah, I mean, some of them just haven't hit anything of any kind since March. So, <laughs> um, not going there. And it was also the Oilers, right? There was some bad blood there. I think there was some guys wanting to lay some hits on some of their foes. I think if we would have seen that preseason game against Dallas or Winnipeg or um, Toronto, I think you wouldn't have seen as many hits. Yeah. True enough. And, th- I mean, that was very much a symptom of the, I'd call it the Battle of Alberta all year. We saw a goalie fight this year in the Battle of Alberta. Like, things got heated this year between the two. Yeah, and I think that the Flames just need to have controlled aggression and try to wear the stars down. And I think that, like, if the Flames are going to be successful throughout the playoffs, like, even if they get past Dallas that they're going to have to physically engage and be on the other teams and finish their checks, but, like, do things responsibly at the same time. For sure. And I think, and we sort of hinted on it earlier as well, we're going to need that first line to really limit its minutes as well. Because if you're going to get into the next round, you need Johnny, Monty, and Lindy to all be ready to go. So I think you need to get your depth scorers doing their thing early in this round because if those guys tire out... Then round two, we end up with what we had in Colorado last year. Yeah. And I'm just glad that the Flames can't play Colorado until the conference finals if, you know, they can get there. Who does Colorado play? Uh, They play the Arizona Coyotes. And with how it works, uh, they would play... um, There's no way that we can play them in the second round. Like, it, it would either be Vancouver or St. Louis playing them, okay. or Chicago, one or the so other. You're, so you're thinking if we do have to end up against Colorado, let's wait until we're deep, and, or, and you're thinking they might be a, a little easier at that point. Yeah, well, at least they'll be tired more so. So will we. Yeah, but, you know, our guys are physically engaged, and more so, and, yeah. I don't see the same team toughness from Colorado, so, yeah, it. we'll see. Well, let's see how the first four games go. We'll come back and do another episode after game four on the 16th. We'll record probably that evening. So we'll let the first four games play out. For all you know, we could be talking about a four-game sweep, though I doubt it. 
Um, Matt, I think we're both of the opinion Calgary has a good chance of winning this round if they engage themselves. Is that fair to say? Yeah. If they play even remotely close to their potential, they beat the Stars. If they don't, it's more them beating themselves. I think if we see the team that showed up for the majority of the time against Winnipeg, they win this round. Yeah. Yeah, I think if that's the case, it's a five-game series, Flames win. So let's we'll chat next week and see what happens. But of course, we now that we're back, we want you guys to engage with us. Remember, you can always call our feedback line. Uh, call us, text us. Let us know your thoughts during these four games. You can reach us on the phone. Again, call or text at 587-200-7176. That number again is 587-200-7176. If you just want to tell us who you thought was good tonight or... Uh, you know, your favorite moment of a game, feel free to call us, text us, whatever. You can also get a hold of us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. Uh, tweet us there, follow us there, see what we're talking about. We often talk about the game, after the game, stuff like that. And on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. So again, follow us there. We have news going into the game, some news during the games. Uh, let us know what you think of the game. We want to hear from you guys because this is the fun time to be a Flames fan is in the playoffs. And the more we can engage with each other, the more fun this is going to be. And the Matt, most you... fun thing was Chicago beating Edmonton. <laughs> All the host cities are out. Yeah. I, had I just somebody hope that used... Edmonton doesn't ruin Lafreniere, too. I had... Well, okay, we won't talk too much about the Oilers, but I think... Ken Holland is smart enough that if they get that first overall pick, he would move it. You've heard me say on this on the show for years, they should move their pick, move their pick, move their pick. I think Holland's now finally a smart enough GM who might actually do that. Yeah. They need help. Lots. But I don't think Lafreniere is the guy that they need. They've got the forwards they need. They need defensemen. They need goalies. You can get whatever you want if you move the Lafreniere pick. Yeah. I know. I'm hoping that Florida, Minnesota, uh, Nashville, or Winnipeg gets it more so than any of the other teams. We'll find out tomorrow night. Or I guess yep. tomorrow during the day. Fun round times. Two, round two of the draft lottery. Yep. Well, Matt, do you want to take us out? As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.